focus on building a vibrant and resilient healthcare system. So I'll build on your pioneering role in establishing Singapore as a premier biomedical sciences hub in Asia. Dr. Liu, you've overseen investments in precision medicine, cell and gene therapy, genomics, digital health, and more. So in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, how have EDBI's healthcare investments, such as in Moderna and Doctor Anywhere, contributed to Singapore's resilience and global healthcare advancements? Ah, uh, yes, yes. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's good that uh, EDBI is, is a strategic investor and a long-term investor. And so one of the reasons why we could invest into Moderna was uh, because of our strategic uh, nature of things. Uh, so we, we were fortunate enough to identify Moderna and invest in it as a disruptive mRNA platform to, to you know, come up with customized vaccines. And we did, we did the investment before COVID happened. It was a small check size, but uh, we, we were very keen to attract Moderna and its capabilities to Singapore. So that, wa- that was the underlying uh, rationale. And, and uh, we were happy that we did that because we, who, who could have predicted you know, the pandemic to have happened? Uh, and that happens to allow us to open doors and, and connect uh, Moderna CEO to to the Singapore you know government authorities and it, it, it's moved and paved the way for all Singaporeans and anyone who's living in Singapore to have the latest Moderna vaccines so um, yes we, we definitely did not lose money from our investments but strategically it also allowed um, Singapore to to be prioritized in terms of uh, you know obtaining the latest Moderna vaccines and Fast forward to the present, Moderna actually has established its presence in Singapore. And uh, I, I would say that uh, because of, of uh, EDBI's foray into investing into mRNA, uh, one would say that it is now uh, attracting other uh, mRNA startups to Singapore uh, because of, of um, yeah, what, what we did in the past. So uh, it's actually an accumulation of, of a lot of effort. Um, biotech investments uh, it started more than 30 years ago when the then uh, founding chairman, Philip Yeo of the Economic Development Board, identified biomedical as, as one, a future economic pillar for Singapore. Um, and thanks to the political stability of Singapore, you can have a lot of long-term planning, right? So, so fast forward to the present, after 30 years of, of R&D into biotech, uh, we, we, we have a lot of talent, actually. And, and then we do send scholars, you know, in the hundreds every year. And over time, they, they all, you know, not all of them want to be scientists. Some of them actually go into industry, gain industrial knowledge, and then they come back and they contribute to Singapore, which is, well, which is wonderful, and especially in the biotech, biomedical space. Not, normally, the, the main complaint is when, after we invest in startups, the main complaint of these startups is there's not enough talent in Singapore. But when it comes to biomedical, there seems to be very good talent because uh, they, they, they seem to be returning to Singapore. So that's uh, actually quite, quite, quite a good point. Um, but Singapore also continues to attract talent by by, by virtue of having a very um, uh, virtuous uh, deep tech ecosystem, not, not limited to biotech. I mean, you know, e- even in um, um, quantum computing and, um, you know, supercomputing, you speak to the Institute of High Performance Computing. So, and then we're very good at data centers. But I digress back, back to biotech. Yes, uh, uh, we, are, we seem to be uh, attra- not attracting um, Quite, quite a lot of interesting uh, biotech startups, uh, contract research uh, organizations, uh, contract development and manufacturing organizations for pharma. Um, we do have all the most of the big pharma in Singapore. Um, so the ecosystem is, is quite good. Um, Singapore is known to be a biotech hub. Um, you know, we strive to be the next Boston of the world, but Boston is one of the very good biotech hubs. So is San Diego. Um, Singapore, hopefully, is, is up there with, with these biotech hubs. So uh, I, I think it's, it's a, a result of long-term planning and ecosystem building uh, that, that we have reached to this stage. Yep. So. 
hope, hope it continues to thrive. Yeah. So thank you for sharing on how investments um, and continued planning have led to the building of the biotech ecosystem in Singapore and that has become as competitive as, as it is today. Mm -hmm. So um, in the context of Singapore, since we have such an aging population, yeah, so like considering this aging population and the challenges posed by this, so what is a vision for the future of healthcare and how do you propose you prepare for it? Yes, yes. Uh, so once again, I think Singapore is a very pragmatic society. Uh, so um, it, it turns out that our healthcare budget will exceed our defence budget, um, which is uh, quite astounding because, I mean, most of the, ever since I grew up, it's always the defence budget that is the biggest, but it uh, seems that the healthcare budget would soon exceed that. So uh, in order to do something about it, um, and plus the fact that uh, actually Singapore has one of the longest living populations in the world. Uh, some reports have indicated that we have now exceeded Japan, right? So uh, yes, so w what do we do about it? Uh, you can live longer, but if your last few years are not healthy and you're bedridden and hooked up to a life support system, it doesn't mean anything. It, it just increases the healthcare budget, right? Uh, so yes, so um, you, you can see the there's a lot of emphasis on living healthily. Um, so uh, A, to, to reduce the burden on hospitals, to reduce the number of people falling ill, and then uh, creating this uh, strain on our hospitals. So it's um, better to uh, you know, uh, live well and age well, means uh, don't fall ill, right? So, uh, and back to your previous point on, on the convergence of technologies, now we can do that. You know why? In the past, we always depended on visiting our general practitioner and at the most maybe we visit four times a year. And then it's like, you know, it's like we're seeing a stranger only four times a year and all, all the GP can tell you is, oh, yeah, eat properly, exercise more. I mean, that tends to be it, right? And uh, if, if you're under the weather, yeah, he, he has some medicine and once again, uh, rest, rest and recover. Um, Fast forward to present, now, now we have uh, amazing technology and always on devices that can monitor all your healthcare statistics 20, 24 by 7, right? And then you throw in your AI, your large language models, it can automatically detect what's wrong with you and give you a warning. Like, you know, simple things like you're sitting down too long, time to get up and exercise. You know, you don't need a doctor to tell you that. You, you don't need to go and, you know, like you, you see some of these Hollywood shows, you have a uh, billionaire who hires a, a full-time uh, person to always monitor you. You don't need that. You just need to invest in in a, a smart wearable and it will give you all your, uh, it will track you, right? It will track your heart rate, you, it will track your movement, it will track your, um, you know, breathing, how much, how, you know, how long you have been sleeping. The things will just get more and more advanced. There, there are all these glucose monitors as well will tell you that, you, you know, you're having a insulin spike. Yeah. Things like that, um, right now, with, with the technology that's available, um, yeah, you, you can easily have yourself monitored 24-7, and, and that's very good. It, um, as more and more people embrace these wearable technologies, then uh, there'll be a lot of advice on how to keep healthy, and then um, bend the cost curve. Like eventually, we just don't, we want our population to be healthy. And if you can embrace all these uh, good habits and get it monitored, um, then at least you know that you, you have a benchmark. You say, oh, you were here. Uh, you used to be able to walk 5,000 steps. Uh, now you're walking 6,000 steps. Eventually, you're going to hit 10,000 steps a day. That's, that's improvement, right? So uh, then, of course, for people who take up sports, and then it's a bit more intensive, you know, your VO2 max and all that, you can always measure it and see whether you're improving, right? And how, how, what, how low is your resting heart rate. So lots of technologies out there. And I think um, it can be put to good use to help our population uh, live well and age well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lui. Uh, we really found it interesting how like mm. the implementation of technology such as AI or like wearable technology and so on can help reduce like the burden on healthcare and uh, in general uh, help us prepare for like the aging population.